Our next speaker will be Rod Lingard uh, from Thomas Miller UK Club, talking on the legal implications of low stimming. Low stimming is one of the uh, actual options available in the market today. So, Rod. Uh, good evening, and thank you for the invitation. Um, my name is Rod Lingard. I'm the syndicate manager at Thomas Miller Hellas. Uh, Thomas Miller are the managers of the UK P&I and the UK Defence Clubs. Uh, if you thought that you had technical problems, then I'm sorry, but I'm going to add to them with some insurance and legal issues as well. But you'll be pleased to know that I'm not a lawyer, and so I'm not going to be referring to a lot of cases, although there is one that I will f refer to just a little bit later, uh, but perhaps I can bridge the gap between the legal side and, and the technical side. Now, I joined uh, a Panamax bulk carrier in 1982. Uh, we took a cargo to Japan. At the time, the market was absolutely dire, and there was nothing available for us at all out of that part of the Far East. Uh, and so we came back across the Pacific at economical speed. I can't remember exactly what it was, but if I say seven and a half, maybe eight knots, uh, I was second mate at the time, and I remember that the Pacific being an awful long time uh, going from Nagoya to Panama at that sort of speed. We eventually, I think we were about a day out of Panama, we got fixed, cargo from New Orleans, so we were able to put our foot down again. Now, the sort of issues that I'm just going to be talking about were not relevant to that voyage because we didn't have a cargo, we are in ballast, and uh, we weren't on charter. Now, I've only got 15 minutes, and so I need to move very quickly to the crux of the problem. Now, I asked my secretary to help me uh, with the illustration on these slides, uh, I thought I would keep this one in, but uh, I, I did have to point out to her the difference between the crutch and uh, a crotch. Uh, thank goodness that she didn't choose anything pornographic. Uh, anyway, the, the crux is this. There's a, there's a conflict. We've got, we've got two contracts. On the one side, we've got the charter party, and the owner's obligation uh, under, uh, well, NYPE anyway, uh, under Clause 8, uh, to follow the st slow steaming instructions from the charterers. And on the other side, we've got a bill of lading contract, where usually you've got an implied obligation of due dispatch. Now, due dispatch means proceeding by the most direct route at the fastest speed. There is legal authority that an unreasonable delay is a deviation. And when I'm talking about a deviation here, I'm talking about a departure from the contractually agreed voyage that would deprive the owner of rights of limitation or defences that are available under usually the Hague or Hague-Visby rules. So quite common then to have a deviation by a geographical deviation, but you can also have a deviation by delay. Now this deviation has a knock-on effect. It affects your p &I cover. You see I've quoted here an excerpt from the UK p &I club's rules, but the other clubs in the international group will have very similar wording in their rules as well. And you'll see from the first sentence there that um, unless and to the extent that the directors in their discretion otherwise decide, or cover has been confirmed in writing by the managers prior to the deviation, there shall be no recovery. So for deviations to be held covered, you've got to report it to your p &I club first, and they'll make a decision as to whether they can hold you covered or not. Otherwise, there's no cover, or at least you've got a director's discretion claim, maybe. Now, there can be implications for other insurances and other issues as well. 
Um, slow steaming brings with it issues of increased inspection, extra maintenance, and crew training. So there may be issues with an insurance claim where there's an engine breakdown and there has been a history of slow steaming. Depending on which hull and machinery clauses you're using, then the underwriters may look to issues of deliberate or negligent mismanagement. Similarly, in general average, uh, issues of uh, maintenance and training are going to come under very close scrutiny. The cargo interests are always looking to try and avoid contributing in general average if they can. So if they can show that the ship owner hasn't exercised due diligence to make the ship seaworthy before and at the commencement of the voyage, on the back of issues regarding maintenance or crew training, then they will be able to avoid contributing in general average. Uh, I said that I would mention one case, uh, and this is it. Uh, it's Bulk Shipping Union SA against Clipper Bulk Shipping, uh, better known by the ship name, the Pearl Sea. Now, the owners chartered the Pearl Sea. Uh, it was an amended NYPE form. Uh, it was from six to nine months. The charter party contained a performance warranty that the ship was capable of steaming at 13 knots in good weather, laden and in ballast. It was common ground between both the owners and the charterers that the performance warranty only applied on delivery. It wasn't a continuing warranty. The charter party also incorporated the Hague rules and it incorporated a London arbitration uh, and an English law clause. The charterers withheld hire. They alleged that there'd been a breach by the owners of the utmost dispatch obligation under Clause 8 of the NYPE form. They also said that the charterers could deduct lost time due to slow steaming under the first part of Clause 15, which is the off-hire clause. Now, the tribunal held that in respect of three out of 16 voyages, there had been deliberate slow steaming because that was the only reasonable explanation. They also said that there'd been a breach of Clause 8 and that there had been a net loss of time under Clause 15. The owners appealed. The matter went to the High Court. The owners raised two main arguments. The first was that the arbitration tribunal had been in error because they converted this performance warranty into a continuing warranty. And secondly, that the Hague Rules exception, the Article 4, Rule 2A exception, um, the error by the master in the navigation or the management of the ship was available to them. So that defense would defend the, the, the uh, charterer's claim. The matter went before Justice Popplewell, and he said that there was no error by the tribunal, that the arbitration tribunal were right. Firstly, he said that it was okay to use the warranted speed as a benchmark against which to assess whether the ship was proceeding with due dispatch. And he also said that in a case of deliberate, a deliberate decision to slow steam, that the defense under the Hague rules wouldn't be available. So, how do we get around some of these issues? Well, it's through charter party clauses. There's three clauses that I want to mention. The first here is the, is the BIMCO time charter party clause. I've identified with the bullets here just some of the main points. It's not all of them. You'll see the charterers may instruct the master in writing to slow steam. So it's got to be in writing. An oral instruction is not enough. And then there's two options. One is slow steaming. 
the other is ultra slow steaming. Um, the intention is that one of the two options will be crossed out. If neither is crossed out, then the slow steaming option applies by default. Now, slow steaming under the clause is described or defined as operating at a speed above the cutout point of the ship's auxiliary blowers and that it will not result in the engine operating outside the manufacturer's recommendations. Ultra slow steaming, however, gives the charterers the option to instruct the master to proceed at a speed either above or below the cutout point of the ship's auxiliary blowers. Now these options that the charterers have in regard to slow steaming or ultra slow steaming, they're always subject to the master's overriding um, obligation in regard to safety of the ship, safety of the crew, safety of the cargo and protection of the environment. So if the master is concerned about those sort of issues, then he doesn't have to comply with the, with the charter's slow, uh, slow steaming instructions. Um, the clause goes on to say that there, um, if the master complies with the charterer's instructions, there is no breach of the due dispatch obligations which I mentioned earlier. The bottom two bullet points, two important points here, two obligations on the charterers, one is to ensure that there is no breach of the bill of lading due or utmost dispatch requirements, and the charterers would do that by incorporating the charter party slow steaming clause into the bill of lading, and secondly, that the charterers will indemnify the owners to the extent that the owner's obligations under the bill of lading are more onerous than under the slow steaming clause in the charter party. Second clause is the BIMCO uh, slow steaming clause for voyage charter parties. It's a much simpler, shorter clause than, than the time charter party clause. Um, you'll see from that first bullet point there that only the owners are entitled to instruct the master to proceed at uh, slow steaming, not the charterers. But then it really follows the time charter party clause. There's no breach of the due dispatch obligation. Charter is to ensure there's no breach of the bill of lading and charter is to indemnify. And also that the clause is without prejudice to other express or implied rights elsewhere in the charter party. The third type of clause that I want to mention is the virtual arrival clause. Um, this would come into play where there is a known delay, uh, known delay at the discharge port. So what's the point of the ship arriving early? Uh, better that she arrives just in time for her slot to load or, or discharge. There needs to be a mutual agreement between the parties and there needs to be an agreed charter party clause, a virtual arrival clause. There then needs to be an agreement on how to calculate the ship's performance and how to share the savings. Um, Intertanko have a couple of clauses. I also recently saw a BP virtual arrival clause. They all work in the same way in that the, um, the extra time on the voyage uh, counts as lay time or if the ship's on demurrage it counts as demurrage and the bunker savings are split 50-50 between the owners and the charterers and then there's a reconciliation. Um, the clause may provide that a WASP or a weather analysis service provider will do the analysis and come up with what the savings are. Uh, finally, uh, just some problems or issues uh, that you should be aware of, even if you incorporate those clauses into your charter party. Um, first of all, the clauses are silent as to who pays for repairs or modifications. The speed and performance warranties elsewhere in the charter party are still, will still apply. I would suggest that the bill of lading incorporation clause makes specific reference to the slow steaming clause 
in the same way that we would if we were trying to incorporate uh, an arbitration clause from the Charter Party into a bill of lading. Uh, again, none of, the uh, none of the clauses have any express indemnity if, after slow steaming, the ship is unable to meet the usual performance warranties. Um, back to the virtual arrival clause again, um, the calculation of the savings is always likely to produce some disputes or arguments. Uh, and then finally, when it comes to indemnities, an indemnity is only as good as the indemnifier. Just three final points. Um, in order to produce uh, my paper today, then... Um, I've read uh, quite a number of articles, and I've seen a lot of reference, particularly in the, in the technical articles, I guess, um, that before you slow steam, you need to be slow steaming ready. Uh, then my rider to that would be that you need to be contractually ready as well. Um, press for inclusion of these charter party clauses, and my final point is that a transparent and open approach so the other parties to the venture is the best approach. And that's it from me. Thank you.